Welcome to another episode of Coder Conversations. Today we have Jason Cabinets, CEO of Cabinets HR and host of the Jason Cabinets HR Experience. How's it going, man? Pretty good, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Good to catch up with you again. Yeah, man. Definitely glad to have you. Uh, so what, uh, can, you, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah. You know, it's always hard to do that when you talk about yourself, right? I mean, but it's something you got to get used to do as an entrepreneur or maybe you're trying to do something right. So I'm a, uh, I like to say I'm a tattooed INFJ, retired U.S. Army officer. Tattoo because I have like 45 tattoos over my body. Uh, INFJ because of the Meyer Briggs, I'm INFJ. Supposedly, oh, there's only one or three percent of us in the world like we like do things differently and we're like kind of weird. And I spent 25 years in the Army where I retired like back in 2015. Um, I'm a CEO founder of an HR tech startup called Cameras HR. We do HR companies for 49 or fewer people. I'm sure me and Kevin will get into all the tech challenges I've had with that as far as being a, a, not, a non-tech founder. And also, uh, like uh, Kevin said, host a podcast where I talk to interesting people. So like a like long form in-person podcast, which actually I have a lot of fun doing that. So how, how did you make the transition from the Army into HR? So I actually did HR in the Army, right? So the, I think the better story is like how I transitioned from the military to startups. So back in 2015, when I retired, Back then, everyone in the army said, "No, go to LinkedIn trying to find a job." So I'm on LinkedIn connecting with people, trying to find work, whatever the case may be. This guy named Mark and Roe reached out to me. He said, "Hey, Jason, my name is Mark and Roe. Have a startup called Meyer Fold. We're going to help military veterans find jobs by doing skills tests and not resumes. Can we meet you in person and you tell me how the army helped you find a job?" I sure. Well, one question for you. What the blanks of a startup? I had no clue, no concept what a startup was, right? Like, you just can't start a company. That's not allowed. All the companies in the world already exist, right? You know, he laughed. Give me a quick dummies version of startups. And it really intrigued me, right? And I made him really hit it off. So I convinced them to let me work for a startup for a couple of years. And from there, I learned that most small businesses don't have HR. So just like a soul transition that way. Of course, a lot more details to it. Yeah, but it was very interesting. So yeah, um, what, what were some of the challenges that you've come across when you started running your own startup? So the challenge is, you know, everyone's going to say, everyone's going to be nice and like, yes, Jason, I'll buy it. Yes, Jason, I'll do this, you know. But are, are they really going to, right? Are they just being nice because you're a friend or because, you know, even if they're not your friend, most people don't want to tell you that your idea sucks, right? So how do you get really, how do you really get true feedback, right? And then, you know, on the other end, someone might give you true feedback. But they're just like a jackass with it, right? So it's like it's a balance, you know. You just gotta learn how to listen to people and what they're not saying. To me, I've learned I've learned more from what people don't say to me versus what they say, you know. Um, and it's just it's just challenge, right? I mean, you have all these, you know, these myths out there. The stereotypical founder gets rich in six months, or I get fundraising in less than a year. I mean, that's true if your last name is Zuckerberg or Musk. Or maybe Adam Newman, you know, that guy from WeWork who just raised like hundred million dollars. But for most people, it doesn't work like that. It's a grind. I mean, I know people who like worked in the stock for six years and finally got the first round of funding. It's it's not easy. Not and and and, and, and then the time cost loss, right? Suppose you're making you could have made like eighty thousand a year, right? That's the money you lost too. But not only that, the time you lose, right? Time away from the family, because you know it, it's a grind. Yeah, I've heard uh, it usually takes like five years or so before uh, new businesses become profitable. Like, how, how did you stay afloat until the profits started coming in? So I'm, I'm very fortunate. Like I said, I retired from the Army and, you know, have a few bills. But, you know, I'll be honest, if I was like a, just a regular Joe person, like had no retirement, there's no way I could do this, right? I mean, there's no way. I couldn't imagine like having a full-time job, making good money and, and doing this on the, and doing this full-time, right? I mean, I know people do it, you know, more power to them, but I, I don't think I could do it right. That's why I'm very fortunate having like a military pay that can like pay all the bills and still like give me like bootstrap, so to speak. But yeah, like like those people out there like doing a full time and full and a full time job, yeah, more power to them, but and that's a lot. So if if you did have a full time job, you say you would just do this on the side? Yeah, I'll probably just do it on the side. Cause that's, that's one thing, like they'll, they'll tell you, you know, keep your full-time job doing the side and you get traction and stuff. But then most investors was, will don't, won't even talk to you unless you're doing this full-time, right? So how do you transition? From, and, and another thing, like if you're doing a business, like some people meet you, like meet me on the weekends after 5 p.m. Like 
or, or is a customer really going to meet with you at 7 p.m. on a Thursday night? Maybe they will, maybe they're wrong, right? And if you have a job, you have to go in the office every day from 9 to 5 and be in a cubicle and people are watching you, like, it's going to be hard for you to, like, do stuff for your job between 9 to 5. But this, and there's so much advice out there, too. This thing I talk about, too, if you do start a company, you'll get so much advice from people. Some you won't ask for, some you won't ask for. And you got to take all the grain of salt. Because someone might tell you something that was successful with them like two years ago, but there's a different economy, different area. Your business might be different. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt. And most people do, like, you know, have good intentions. Also, be aware there's all a lot of scams out there, right? With, like, like feed on like new startup founders and like only want to so say, hey, pay me $50 a month, I'll do this for you. And they do nothing, right? Exactly. So how do you determine whether uh, somebody is actually capable of doing what they say? Like, what are some of the criteria? Yeah, so that's something I, I definitely sucked at at first, right? I, another problem I had too, like not a problem, like a, a mistakes I made. It would be like some I, I obviously a platform, right? I don't really need this platform right now. Plus, I have a sales platform. I don't really need a sales platform right now. But they offer me for like a, a extra, like too much free, fifty percent reduced cost, whatever the case may be. I can afford this, and then eight months later. I spent all this money and I never used it. So even though it sounds like a great deal, I basically flushed down this money down, down the toilet. And there's so many like people out there doing things right. Like I don't care if it's HR, marketing, sales, product development, Google analytics. There's like a thousand and thousand of people who are doing something right. And there's really, really no way for you to like do the background check or deep dive. So sometimes you got to trust your instinct, trust the websites, Hopefully, you know people who can refer you to you. Uh, for, for example, at least once a day, I get a LinkedIn message from somebody in Bangladesh talk about, you know, my SEO is horrible. They want to fix it for me. Hmm. I can't talk for anyone else, but I don't know if I'm going to, like, give my SEO up to some random guy in a third world country, right? I mean, I'm sure some people do and I'm fine with it, but I don't, I don't see doing that right. And also, you got I, I think uh, you have to have a lot of touch points with people, too. You got to... And then again, even you like, even you trust someone and you know them, there's no, um, there's still a risk that might rip you off, right? Because you never know if someone's too um, nature, so to speak, right? You might see them at every networking event, everyone likes them, and then pay them some money for doing something, they, and they ghost you, right? It's, I mean, it's it's not easy. It's a hit and miss. Like, like I gotta say, like I'm not God, so I don't know people's heart or with the line or not. You just have to take the risk because you know eventually you can't do everything yourself. So a lot of it's uh, word of mouth, really, like the yeah, word, word of mouth, uh, your instincts. Um, like for example, if um, like here's a good one. So about uh, so me and Kevin Pre both active LinkedIn. I get this all the time. Someone will send me a LinkedIn message. Hey Jason, I started LinkedIn profile. Um, you can do do you can be, you can be doing a better job growing your network. And they'll like, send me this like like ten page paragraph on LinkedIn message like. Why I should like, let them take over my LinkedIn profile? And I looked at their profile, and they have like 200 connectors, right? Yeah. And I have like way, way more than that, right? Like, why am I gonna let you? That doesn't make sense to me, right? Exactly. So, uh, like, speaking of LinkedIn, uh, you say you got 20,000 followers. How, how long did it take you to grow to that many followers? So, so I started. I got my account in 2013. So it's definitely been a slow process, right? But first, every time I meet someone at a networking event, I say, do you want to connect on LinkedIn? Or I, I, like, I used to send out a lot of connections. I'd really reset it, send out the big connections now. But, I mean, I do have 20,000. And, and that might seem a lot, but I know people are like way, way more than that. Like, those people are like almost like a million followers on LinkedIn, right? So I'm very junior. And then I don't know who made up this rule, but suppose the rule is you need to have at least 500 connections on LinkedIn to like, be like, you know, a known person on LinkedIn, I guess. Who made that rule up? I have no idea. That I always heard that five hundred rule. Have you had like any interest in opportunities as a result of being visible on LinkedIn? I mean, a lot of people reach out to me on the podcast. Uh, of course, I get all the like everyone else does. All the I, I hate to say spam messages, but some spam messages, you know. And I think lately, like probably like once a week, I get some random LinkedIn request from someone who's like a Asian female. It'll say she's 24 mm -hmm. years old, but the CEO of some billion dollar company out of Singapore, right? So yeah. I would get a lot of those, you know. And, and LinkedIn just a, is an interesting place, right? 
like it doesn't know what it wants to be i think is it is it business is it facebook is it something else i think i think it'd be everything right there's a lot of great content on content on there um i know a lot of people, a lot of people get mad at the post like i don't like this post it's blah 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 i would have been like if you don't like it you know maybe it's not for you just scroll on you don't have to leave a comment you know but a lot of people like feel like they gotta leave a, leave a two paragraph comment on why this certain post is not for linkedin right well mm-hmm. maybe it's, maybe it's not for you maybe it's for her followers or maybe whatever the case may be right yeah it's definitely an interesting uh place man speaking of uh podcasting what made you want to get into the podcasting sector so i really i did it so i i made like some big pivots on podcasts i really did my podcast it was called the cavern state Trial podcast it was like market my company when i first did it i did like everyone else like 30 minute podcast and i was talking to other hr people and finally like sometimes i'm kind of slow as for like being smart you know sometimes a light bulb like comes on real slowly so it finally dawned on me like if you're doing the podcast for your company these hr people are not gonna buy hr from you right especially if they own hr company hr directly right makes no sense right and so i transitioned to the jason cabin experience where i talked like you no know, people like entrepreneurs other interested people small business owners also when i was doing a 30 minute podcast like it just went too fast right because i'm a curious person uh, i had all these questions i want to ask and so like i transitioned to like a long form podcast so i could ask questions i want like you know like i had a the guy on saturday uh kevin he's a president of a cybersecurity company if i would i did a 30 minute if i would have done a 30 minute podcast it would just be better the business but since we did it two and a half hours i learned that he, that he sailed from miami, miami to italy that he lived here since 2013 from germany that he grows the garden with kids you know so just learning those kind of things right more of a deep dive and and everyone will tell me jason there's no way i could talk for two hours right or three hours right there's no way but every single time we're like finish a three-hour podcast every time they say jason i, I thought why are you only talking for 30 minutes I'm like dude check your watch because no one believes how fast the time goes by especially like if the people you know have a good back and forth they ask the questions you know and of course, you know, offer offer bourbon too. So when the guests drink bourbon, that really makes it a whole lot better. Yeah, like they really start, you know, just talk talking. So yeah, I noticed uh, you really got your studio set up there. Um, so is most of your podcast done in person now? Yeah, they're pretty much they're pretty much all in person. I try to anyway. And so I think like people like who want to think about starting on podcasts, like most people they start they start like a laptop a, a webcam like a like a cheap 35 dollar mic right there's no need like to go all out right i mean you, you can do that later on like you know get some um get some listeners get some downloads for your upgrade another thing too make sure it's something you really want to do i, I think the stats show that like for, for every 100 people who start a podcast only five are still doing it after 10 episodes because i was like during during covid like millions of people start a podcast for their home while pretty much none of them are doing podcasts anymore um i think i'll make this of course i make this number up i think on apple Podcasts they have like eight million or nine million registered podcasts on there but only like a little less than a billion dollars actually i actually put out podcasts on a regular basis right so if you want to start a podcast start one because it's not as many podcasts as you think but definitely know it's going to be you know it's going to be a grind and most people think you know you need to do at least a hundred podcasts for like you, for you upgrade for you to start what you're going to do right and you're going to you're going to pivot too yeah i think most people kind of look at it as a get rich quick scheme they think they, they got they got yes. some good information they're going to pop up then millions of people are just going to jump on but it yes. doesn't work like that yeah everyone's not joe rogan right and people don't realize joe rogan was joe rogan way before he started the podcast right like he had a following he was on fair factor he was on tv shows and even if you go back to like Joe Rogan's first hundred, I mean they they I mean they suck right. They're they're freaking horrible right. And he did just to you know have a fun have a platform and now you know it's turning something totally like you know engaging right. So you have to do it for like you know like you said put the information out and, and like and another thing too people will say do a podcast to make money do a podcast you know put your stuff out there you need to do a podcast because it's something you want to do. Like you need to do a podcast if it was just you and like 10 listeners right something you want to have fun with and then and then the downloads and listens a lot of people i know they'll quit if the podcast only has only has like 55 listeners right or 55 downloads they'll give up oh i don't i'm not getting enough listeners whatever and i always try to say <coughs> what what would you give to talk to 55 the same 55 people once a week in, in person right in conference room, right and you got to think of like that if you only have 55 downloads these 55 people listen to you every day i mean every week 
and you give them the information. That's 55 potential customers, 55 potential something, right? That you have that you yep. wouldn't have regardless. Yeah, no, a lot of people don't realize it's like really hard to, you know, get get attention because there's so many other podcasts. So oh, yes. that doesn't determine the quality of the podcast. It's just like hard to break out when there's so many other people doing the same thing. And that's a great point, Kevin. Like you're just not competing against other podcasters. You're competing like, you know, TV, Netflix, radio. You're competing against all forms of content. You're competing against, you know, somebody that's decided, you know what? I'm not going to watch anything today. I'm doing a 24 hour um, digital fast, right? You're competing against all of that. Exactly. So, so like, it's almost like you have to do something extreme to stand out or you just have to be extremely consistent. To... Yes. Yes. Like, what, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned while podcasting? Um, just, I think you just going to be consistent. And um, I think the main thing you gotta, for me, I think, I, yeah, I think you have to put the focus on your guests, right? You have to make your guests shine as best as you can. I remember I was on a podcast one time a few years ago. The podcast was 30 minutes long. I talked for three minutes. I'm like, how, how as I as a guest, I'm only going to talk for three minutes, right? So I think you don't want to do that. I, I think the good ratio is like somewhere where 70, 30 for your guests, maybe 80, 20, you know, 80%, 70% for your guests, and then you talk some, you know, and always encourage your guests, like, talk more, you know, expand on stuff. Um, of course, there's a fine line. If you ask a question and 30 minutes later they'll start talking, you might want to, you know, try to cut them off, you know, redirect them. And another thing with podcasts, too, you never know who's listening, right? I mean, you just never know who's listening or not listening. I've been a networking investor. Oh, yeah, I listen to your podcast all the time. I mean, and like, because you sometimes forget when you're doing podcasts that like people actually listen to it, right? Yeah. And it's ever it's evergreen content. So I've had people say, hey, I just listened to your podcast with so-and-so. I'm like, man, I, I, I didn't even hear him two years ago, right? How do you find that? Oh, I just went to a Google search and it came up. Um, so there's that. And for me, it's just a lot of fun. I can meet a lot of interesting people I would never met. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a naturally curious people person. Like when I talked to a guy, Kevin, on Saturday, I had no idea he was in selling. So I could have talked for like two hours just on selling, right? I mean, like this dude, went to, he sailed from Miami to Italy with three other people on a sailboat and none of them knew each other, right? So like you just learn stuff like that. Like I know the guy I learned of Brett Green. He's like really big in, in the tech startup scene here. He was a road manager for the Ramones for 10 years. I would never learn that. So you just learn a lot of interesting things about people you wouldn't know if you just did a 30 minute podcast. And, and people will say, I'm sure you think the same thing, Kevin, like, how you get all these guests? Well, first of all, like someone used that something to sell, right? Either a book, a product, they want to talk about themselves. Especially if, if you're an entrepreneur, right? Most people as entrepreneurs want to get out there and talk about as much the company as much as they can. And with you, with gender developers and developers, they want to know how they how they're growing, you know, themselves to get a job, right? Everyone has a story. To, everyone has to say, oh, everyone has a story to tell, but you have to ask the right question to get the story out. Yeah, now what, what I found is like, um, you know, especially in the software space, a lot of people are introverts. So this kind of gives them an opportunity to, to, to talk to people when they normally don't do that on a day to day basis. So that's kind of like one of the reasons that a lot of them have come onto my platform. So it's, it's yes. pretty interesting. Yeah. Plus, you, you ask great questions, too. I think that's a good, big thing, too. Like I would listen to some podcasts and you, you were like, man, that's how this guy asks horrible questions, right? Or this guy's not a good conversation. It's good conversationalist, right? And people ask me where I get my question from. So my process is when someone comes on, I have this, they send me their bio, and I do like a quick Google search or social media search. I get my target points from there. And then before you start, before we go live, I ask them, what, is there anything specific you want me to ask you? And then probably more importantly, is there anything you don't want to talk about? And then we just start talking, right? Because something pops in my head, I'm going to ask it. You know, I don't think like too crazy, you know, like, but usually something pops in my head, I just ask that question. So, like, uh, when, when you started your podcast originally, it was a HR based podcast and you kind of transitioned more into yes. a general space. Yeah, just HR questions. Yeah, it's, it's it was got so boring, same yeah. stuff every day, you know. And what I used to do, and I quickly changed, I used to ask like the person, what do you think about what, what do you think about HR? Some would say, I don't think about it at all. I don't need HR. So probably was a good thing for me having time with HR business, but people say HR is not needed, right? So I had to quickly change that. <clears throat> exactly. I think it's kind of the danger of being too niche. Like most of the 
podcasts they start sounding the same like you mentioned and you get bored and if you're bored that's that's it for the podcast so, yeah you know. and i know some people say you should do your podcast like be niche like only talk to hrp only business but even though, like I'm, I'm pretty general like all my beta testers uh my customers my nurse intents all that came from the podcast my board of advisors came from the podcast so a lot of stuff came from the podcast even though it's not like a niche hr thing and, 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 you're, and you're always learning, right? So when I first started, I would just do the podcast with someone, right? But what I do now is, like, I ask them to like, do an Apple podcast review. I ask them to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I do a demo with them before we get started, right? So before I would do that stuff, now I, I try to do that stuff. To take better advantage of someone being in my studio with me. Yeah, I, th- I think, like, with the, the, the niche thing that uh, initially it can get you more eyes, but... Uh, it's, it's kind of dangerous because if that sector kind of falls out of favor, then your podcast is essentially done for. So, yes, yes. So, like, what what direction are, are you planning on taking your podcast in the future? Are you gonna pretty much stay in the same uh, alignment, or are you gonna? Yeah, I think I'm gonna stay the same alignment. Um, like, I've done a better job of like pushing out clips, like five, one, ten minute clips, pushing on the social media, YouTube stuff like that. I've done a better job of that. Um. I, a, I, I just got to move to a new studio recently, like on the March 1st. So I'm doing an in-person podcast now. Again, that's been real good. Um, upgraded some of my camera equipment. Had a guy, my friend of mine, Kevin, he set everything up for me, like the wiring, the lights, you know, he does stuff for me. So, that, so that's a big help. That's a big advantage I have, too. So it was just me. It would be like stuff everywhere, right? The angles are correct, all that kind of stuff. So that's good. And I just like, you know, I just like doing it, right? It's, even if, my, like, if I shut down Kevin's H, I would, probably, I would still do, keep on doing the podcast, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's that's the strength of actually loving what you're doing because, like, when you don't see that you're getting the numbers you expect, uh, if you don't love it, you're just going to end up quitting. So you know, yes, I, I, I think it's that consistency that eventually you know you'll start breaking through once more and more people start watching. But you have to kind of stick with it until you get to that point. Yeah, and, and then you always get like little um, little facts that make you think you're doing better, right? Because like. I get emails every day from like podcast agencies or people know can, want to be on the podcast. Last time I checked, I think I have a backlog of 150 people want to be on the podcast, you know, both either in person or with Zoom, right? So to me, that's a good indicator that I'm doing something right. And eventually, bits of numbers come. Even and, and like my numbers are like high, high. But another thing, like, you know, uh, regarding the podcast, I think Stanford Show, if you only get like 500 downloads an episode, you're like in the top 50%, you know, if you think about 500 downloads, it's not a lot, right? So, mm-hmm. and then I think if you have like a thousand, you're like top 90% or something like that. And of course, the Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, is, and Gary Vee is like the top zero, 0.1%, right? Millions of views, right? But if your podcast only gets 500, you're top 50%. Only a thousand, you're like top 90%, right? So it doesn't take a lot to be up there. And sometimes I think those numbers that they show you, they're not even accurate because sometimes oh, yeah. I see weird stuff like somebody got 150 thumbs up, but. 20 views or something like how I know that yeah yeah I know podcast that's they're so jacked up right like you might have an episode and it'd be like lots of views the next one be like hardly any views and like there's all these like none of the stats sync up stats sync right like you have Apple you have YouTube Spotify like you might have like a we'll say 300 downloads on on, on your on Apple podcast but then we'll say a thousand views on LinkedIn for a clip you put on LinkedIn right so how does that all add up right to the does a thousand count for your podcast stats? Like I don't know. It's it's it's, it's confused. Like whenever whenever someone asks me like how many downloads you get, like man, I could give you a number, but I'll probably lie to you, right? Exactly. I, I think you know the bigger the bigger thing now is just to focus on like like you mentioned the people who's actually reaching out to you, and that's where the real opportunities come from. Not necessarily being like somebody who has the stats of a million watchers, because you know like you mentioned. Uh, those aren't necessarily accurate. I kind of feel like the the gatekeeping is back. Like, you know, the big companies, they say, okay, we want this, this, this yeah. person to be pushed, suppress everybody else. Yeah, another thing I should do, and I got away from, when I first started, I was like really like track numbers and stuff, like almost like, not daily, but pretty much sometimes I would go track numbers. Now I do it like once in a blue moon, you know, because like, first of all, if you're tracking numbers, they're never going to be high as you want them, right? You're always going to be disappointed. So, and but then again, you know, it's still good to track numbers like once in a while, I think sort of kind of like if you're like, we'll say you have 2000 downloads an episode, 
And three months later, you came back, it was like down to 200. Obviously, you're doing something wrong, right? So I do think you have to track it some kind of way. Or maybe like me, I add everything up and divide it by the episode number, which I know is not accurate, you know, but it's it works for me. Yeah. So don't I don't always worry about numbers too much unless you're like trying to get monetized. And then most podcasts podcast advertise you have to be like Joe Rogan or Tim Ferriss, you know, because I think you'd have at least a minimum of 10,000 downloads an episode. And even then, I think if you get 10,000 downloads an episode, you only make like 10 bucks off it or something, something insane. Yeah, is it like you know those, those people that's making like fifty million or ten million? That's kind of like a super tiny, yeah, like sector. So like, I, I think podcasts are good for visibility, uh, putting information out, making connections. Like if you need a benefit other than just enjoying podcasting. Like. Yeah, and another time I do the podcast, I've been this for a while. So like, suppose I have like a two-hour podcast interview with someone, I'll go and I'll go through it, and I, I'll take our clips of that person talking, like doing something, some, saying something cool, something nice. Instead of making a two minute video of it, I'll repost that like maybe six months later and say, you know, put it on LinkedIn, like, hey, at, you know, Kevin Miller talks about how we got into the software development, development right? And what, and what it does, like, he'll get, you know, Kevin will get tagged. And I'll be like, oh man, I forgot about this podcast with Jason. And maybe, just maybe, he might just talk to someone who needs HR. Or maybe, it, so it keeps you top of mind with those people you talked to before and lets you know that, hey, I'm still posting stuff for you. I'm still doing stuff for you, so to speak, right? Exactly. Like, and then plus, I think like even with startups, uh, we we always like have this shoot for the moon philosophy. Like, it has to earn millions of dollars, or it's a failure. Like, why can't it be successful if it earns you a few extra thousand a month? You know? Yes. Definitely. So, like, um, what what are some what are some of the more interesting guests that have been on your podcast? Oh um, man, I've had some great guests. So, um. Last week, I had a guy named Byron Robinson. He ran the 400 meter hurdles in the 2016 Olympics. So that was a great guest. He's in the, in the financial industry now. Uh, I had a guy named Charlie Contugo. I know I said his last name wrong. He was like pretty much like top photographer in Seattle. He has, it just, like he used to be a musician. Um, he had a, he had a good, good life story. One guy, uh, Miguel Ayala out of Denver. He has a, a company that they, they uh, ship satellites in the lower, or lower orbit. A guy named Quentin Morris, he's like a master violinist here in Seattle. I, I just had a, quite a few interesting guests. I'm so like, fortunate with that. How, how, how did you, you said that like you have a huge backlog? Um, how did, how did, uh, are, are they reaching out to you or are you reaching out to them? It's a combination. Um, so like what I do, I, I reach out to my first connection on LinkedIn. I don't know if it's a relevant, like suppose I but first connection links like a real estate agent, I'm not going to have my podcast. The financial advisor but like you know like i reached out to one person she's the executive director for the um, um american cancer society so i reached out to her because i thought it would be, be a good one uh we talked to a, a lady she's the director for the uh, masters entrepreneurship program at the university of washington so as long as i think it'd be an interesting story like you know if you're a real estate yeah i probably i probably not interested to talk to your financial advisor probably not unless i know you personally yeah and then of course like for the for the pocket agencies a lot of them, like they, they try to you know, talk to coaches. I don't really talk to coaches anymore. I just I, I know them, you know. So it, it's you know, this stuff. Yeah. Are are you kind of like trying to avoid people that just want to get on your show and advertise their product? Yeah, I, I am. I mean, like it's and that and that's it, miss too, right? Because some of them do have stories to tell. Like when I first started, I talked to a lot of coaches. Like probably nine percent, like you know, you just tell them like I want to say like use call shares, but it's all about them or what they can do, you know. So I, I try to stay away from them now. Which I, of course I can have, like I can be a little more uh, discerning in what guests I have on now. So I know I know a lot of people are using these AI tools and things of that nature. Are you uh, into the AI or are you kind of staying away? Oh man, I want to get more involved in it, right? Like yeah, I'm, I'm so far behind that kind of stuff. It's like, like is this the beginning of Skynet? You know, is the beginning of the, yeah. of the of iRobot takeover? You know, like I mean, who knows? It's some, I think it's some good or bad stuff too. You know. I don't think people, one thing I talk about on a podcast all the time, I don't think the average American realizes like how much tech is coming, right? Like we have no clue. Like, I think we're gonna have like drone deliveries everywhere. We're gonna have, it's, uh, it's, it's it, I don't know. I think yeah, it's scary and exciting at the same time. Yeah, it's just like something that can immediately, like completely revolutionize society. But like you mentioned, it's extremely dangerous if, uh, you know, something goes wrong, like, yeah. 
once this thing gets unleashed on the internet, you can't put it back in the bottle. Yeah, and I'm saying kind of the same subject. I just hope that people are like, you know, thinking through all the consequences, right? Because I, I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, like, like uh, autonomous trucks, like semis, like driving and no more drivers, right? Well, if you do it overnight, you're going to have like hundreds of thousands of people unemployed, right? Yeah. Now, of course, they're going to have find new jobs, like maybe doing something else in the trucking industry, but still, like, if you got rid of all, I'll make this number up, 250,000 truck drivers overnight, man, that's like a hit the economy that's really big, right? It's like, so if someone smarter than us thinking these, th- these things through, I-, I hope so. And I- I've heard some people kind of compare it to like the calculator, but I-, I almost feel like it's more than that. It's more like paying somebody to do your homework for you. Like how many people are going to lose their skill set because they're just going to chat GBT, hey, type me up a marketing promotion. Yeah. Or... Exactly, you know, because you know, you're going to lose that brain function because of like a, um, Oh, what's the clip from um man, what's his name? Um Neil Tyson, the, the black scientist, the famous mm-hmm. one. So he was talking about um how people always say, like, oh, I should learn math, you know, I'll never use math, you know, blah blah blah. And he says, Well, the, the point is not that you're gonna learn math. By using math, you you're training your that part of the brain to be useful, right? So you don't yeah. use math, you never use that part of the brain. So if you use your chat GPT, you know, how much is our, of our brain fuck are we going to we lose? And to me, the danger is like chat, TTP or A or whatever. What if someone purposely codes in the wrong information, right? Like someone, like mm-hmm. example, you ask a question, who is the first president of the United States? And someone puts in, um, I don't know, um, Dave Chappelle. You know, obviously it's wrong, but 100 years from now, maybe people don't know it's wrong, right? Yeah. Like, like, like who's validating the information is correct? Yeah, that's 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 the that's a big danger. Like, you know, the less research that we personally do, we're just gonna accept whatever this AI is given to us. And I think the other well, danger is like if it's doing your the job for you, then it just essentially replaced you. Like you're just kind of like just there, you know. Like if it's if it's right in the marketing campaign for me, if it's right in the novel for me, um, it just it essentially just replaced me. Yeah, and why can't you? exactly do you think this is going to lead to like widespread layoffs in the in the future i, I think it is to be honest with you I, I think it is uh another thing that was kind of some same subject you know like recover came remote work came and all these people are like hey i don't i don't need to go back to office i can do, i can do my job from here well now employers like hey you know you're right you, you, you can do your job from there however comma Anyone can do this job for anywhere. So instead of me paying you hundred thousand a year to whatever you're doing, I can pay someone else. Like instead of me paying you hundred thousand dollars a year, and you live in Seattle and you're like six blocks away, you don't want to come to work. I can pay someone, you know, hundred dollars out of Bama seventy thousand a year. Yeah. You know, and I don't think people are thinking things like that, or maybe just you know, outsource to a third world country. Yep. That's 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 like a, one of the major trends. Um, I kind of feel like a lot of the tech giants, they're kind of laying people off here. Oh, yeah. And yeah. They're going to move the jobs over to another country. <clears throat> but I think, like, you know, it saves uh, those companies money initially. But in the long run, if our economy collapses, who's going to buy their products? Exactly. And like you always say on, on your post, like you're, you're advising people, like, no matter how good your job is or what is going on, like, you know, you know, you got to search for a job every, every once in a while, keep your six skills up to date. The last thing you last thing you want is you know you work for some company for three years and you think everything is groovy and then you know you get yeah. the layoff notice because it's not like these companies say keep your two weeks notice right or hey jason you know things are going bad you might lay you off it's too much you need to start thinking look for a job no it's like hey jason come in here you're fired or you're laid off right and then yeah. you're like oh shit. and I, I think you talk about a, a good thing too kevin at least i think you do like you, you can't be all you, you can't be like my job is my existence, right? You can't be yeah. Kevin Miller's a software developer at Simpsons Company, right? No, you have to be like I'm Kevin Miller, software developer. I'm Jason Cavanaugh, this right? Because these companies like they have no loyalty, right? It's it's a two way street. Yeah, but it's not like a, it used to be like somebody to stay at a company for for uh, twenty years, get a pension. Like pensions yeah. are non existent. Get a good watch, yeah. It always makes you laugh when like you're on LinkedIn, someone say, oh. So and so left me with no notice, and this is like employees don't work for more. Like, get the blank out of here, right? Are you kidding me right now? You know darn well that you would have got rid of that person with no remorse. 
you know, if you had to. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think uh, people are getting kind of like a PTSD from this uh, from this job market because they're not being prepared. Like nobody's telling them. Like you know, there's, there's a lot of positivity. That's that's really what gets people to thumb your stuff up, but nobody's telling the reality. Like you could be laid off at any time from these companies, so you need to have like a nest egg. You need to have savings. You need to stay prepared. Yeah, so have a side hustle and always like you know. Like if you're a developer, always be, you know, learning new skills, you know, upgrading your stuff, make yourself more um, employable or whatever. Another thing, too, like people don't realize, or maybe they probably do, right? I don't care what the economy is like, what the unemployment rate is, right? It's never easy to find a job. I don't care what okay. people say, right? You got the best economy in the world. It's hard to find a job. What's the economy is hard to find a job. It's it's never easy. And I think it's, a, for me, my point, I think there's a reason for this. One reason is I think it's always a disconnect. Like, suppose you suppose you get laid off. Suppose you have a company and you and you lay someone off, right? Well, suppose I get laid off from a job. Well, I need to find a job right now, like sooner or later, right? I have a mortgage, I have bills to pay. Like, I can't mess around and wait three or four months to find a job. I need one now, right? Well, if a company's hiring, you know, suppose a company like someone quit from a job, right? And so they kind of need someone right now, but they take the time, right? They're gonna have like other people do additional duties to do that job. You know, they're going to like, you know, go through all this interview process. So the employee needs a job now. The company is going to take the time, right? So I think that's makes a disconnect. And another disconnect, I think, between the, I think it's between the candidate, the recruiter, and the hiring manager, right? Because a lot of times the candidate, you know, they apply for jobs that are not really qualified for. I know some people say, you know, if you, if you uh, meet 70% 70, 70 of the qualifications, they'll apply for it. You know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Other people say, you know, more higher percentage. So a lot of people apply, apply for jobs, no, nowhere, nowhere qualified for. I think that's a disconnect. Then of course, you know, recruiters and both candidates, they go see each other now, unfortunately, right? No, no, I look for a job every six months. I have a thing where I, I got the final interview and then heard nothing from anyone else. Like, man, I, I made the final interview. Can you at least like send me an email saying you're not hiring me, right? Like, you know, so that's ridiculous. But I think the one per, one that does not get enough, enough names is a hiring manager, right? Mm -hmm. Hire manager, they'll do a job description. The recruiter will have the perfect person to go there and then they'll they'll change the um description, right? Or well this person is not good enough, or this person is this or this person is that right. And so it just goes back and forth. And this another thing too with jobs. Things stats show like for every job there's like two hundred applications and they only maybe call like ten for phone interviews, maybe five for in-person interviews. So if you get an in-person interview and if you don't make it, you should take it as a good time you're doing something right. Now, if you're applying a hundred jobs, you don't get a phone call, a phone interview, like you do something wrong, right? You need to get some advice from someone. Yeah, like what 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 are some of the things that people are doing that kind of turns off employers from them? So one thing I realized, like everyone, like you're gonna have all these people say, I'm a hiring expert. No one's a hiring expert, right? Like no one, I don't care what they say. So you're telling me every person you hire to stay with your company, Every person in your company is like still doing great things. I would bet, I would bet my retirement the answer is no, right? And so, and you really don't know what people want to do. Like, I like, um, like, so I'm a startup. So I tell, I'll tell people, like, having a resume and a, and a pitch deck is the same thing. You, know, you give it 25 people, get 25 different opinions. Only opinion that matters is a, is a hiring manager or the recruiter, right? So, like, I know people, like, who they only like black and white resumes. I know people like they like creative stuff. I know people like just like different things, right? You never know what someone likes or doesn't like, right? Like for me, you no, know, I'm a military veteran. So when I work jobs, if someone's a veteran, I kind of try to push my head if I could, as long as they're qualified. And something you'll never know. So when I was college, I was president of my university, body president of my university. So if I saw someone like student government on there, I'm like, okay, I need to take a closer look because like, you know, I knew what they had to do, right? And then, you know, I know some people like don't like this, don't like this. And so, that we get a grid through us. I know people this before you got a network, right? For example, I was a HR director at a local college here for a few years after I got the army. And for like we had like two hundred applications for each job, right? So I would go through them, whatever. But sometimes someone would call me, hey Jason, hey, have you seen a, a resume from so and so? No, to be oh hey, it's right here. Okay, I would never you know, I would never even look for this person to call me, right? And so you had a network and network network, you know, like this is pretty much impossible to do, but they say if you're looking for a job or starting a company, you need, need to meet one new person each day. Is that doable? Yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it's not right. But yeah, you gotta 
you got to put yourself you can't if you look for a job from like your home computer every day send out resumes it's it's gonna be hard for you i think but of course you know plenty of people find job by doing that so yeah yeah i think everybody got to do something that that works for them um but like from your experience how important has it been to like actually go out and meet people and you know kind of shake their hand does, does that make uh, you stand out yeah i definitely think it makes you stand out because they you know they put a name to the face name to a resume right uh, you know you can say like for example um post amazon is hiring here in seattle right you know before you put your resume in of course amazon is not a good example but i'll use them anyway because amazon know from the charts they're hiring like slow but suppose you see amazon hiring like a marketing manager oh amazon hosting a marketing meetup let me go you know and you meet the person hiring right and another thing too like you always got to follow up and do different things like just don't send your resume to the website you know find out who the recruiter is find out the twitter handle like send them a twitter message you know or instagram message like you got to do things that make yourself stand out and you know it's a challenge right i mean we all have lives you know if you're married have kids or you know whatever case may be you gotta take care of that too so it's definitely a challenge yeah i think people don't really realize the importance of kind of like learning marketing in different ways because like you mentioned you got to make yourself stand out no matter what you do like even when we're doing this podcast like what makes us different from a thousand other people doing the same thing yeah it's, it's definitely a challenge finding a job regardless right and another thing too like you gotta, you gotta have some kind of mental toughness right because you're gonna hear no probably 99 percent of the time you know and you, you, you're gonna be like you know like, man this is a perfect job for me I had a great interview i got a good vibe and then like they go somewhere else right and, and another thing too like a lot of people get like depressed or like kind of sad or, or not having to get hired you know it's not fair well, you got to keep in mind, just maybe, just maybe the other person won't qualify to you, right? Or maybe they knew the other person or, you know, there's so many reasons yeah. for you not to get hired, you know, and you can't take it personal. Yeah, that, that, that is interesting. Like, you, you never know why your resume got rejected. You could be a great candidate, everything checked off. But like you mentioned, they simply knew the person and that's who they went with. Yeah, I mean, it could, it could be anything, any a number of reasons, right? You know, and of course, some might be illegal, some might be just no personal preference, you know? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't being prepared for the reality of the job market. That's why they're finding it so hard. Like, they kind of, you know, in order for like a boot camp, a coding boot camp to get people, they have to almost promise you a job. Like, hey, come here, pay 20000 we can get you a coding job. But the reality is, probably got to put in hundreds of uh applications and oh, all yeah. that kind of stuff especially with junior developers and it's really bad in seattle right it's like there's all these coding academies up here boot camps and all of them like you know pay this x amount of money and we get you a six-figure job but it's, yeah, it's, it doesn't work like that you know i mean like do, do you kind of foresee like uh politicians cracking down on these boot camps if they're making those kind of claims they, they need to, to be honest with you right I mean, like I, I said, like there's a boot camp in like every city now. You know, like anyone can start one. I, I'm, I'm sure some are really good, you know. But and then like, if you have a boot camp, like, how do you certify your instructors, right? Are you just hiring someone who's been a developer for like two years, right? Or are you actually hiring someone who's like used to be a, a VP of engineering at a big company, right? Like, who's teaching these people? Like, who's doing that stuff? Yeah, sometimes what I've seen, it's like uh, sometimes the people that's teaching the boot camp is like graduates, like, oh, yeah, he did a good job. Let's hire him on. Yeah, I've team. seen I've seen that here in Seattle. I can't think of the name, but like someone like they're like top of class. They would become like a graduate assistant, you know, get paid a little bit of money and basically like a teacher's assistant, like what they do in college. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of that, which can yeah. be good, I guess, you know, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, the software industry is uh, it's interesting. Um, like it's taking a tumble now but everything kind of goes in a cycle um you know it's gonna ramp up again but like in in the next year or so um i think it's gonna be really tough so what, what you take of this kevin it's not like a lot of developers now they're like they used to, they used to have a bachelor degree in something else or you know a phd and something master or something or they spent five years at you know plumber or five years at a salesperson and now they want to be a developer. Do you think it's because they think it's easy money? I'll, I'll just learn this. And I, I learned this. I can learn development in six months and make all this money, right? Yeah, they. I, I think the the big thing about software development is like to an extent, there's not the academic gatekeeping where it's like, okay, you got to have a master's and you got to come from the right school. 
like if you could do the job you could get get paid but a lot of people don't realize that it's not easy to do that to to get skilled to the extent where a company wants to pay you six figures like it's like the, the what, what really gets you paid is okay say for example um you have this big company uh you have uh, multi-million you know multi-million dollar a day uh, product you know if something goes wrong you're paying me to be able to fix it quickly because the longer it's down the more money you lose like there, there, there's a lot of pressure there as well um but i, I think you know the like you like we mentioned there's the boot camps there's all these other entities they profit off of like getting more candidates more bodies in their schools so they got to kind of sell sell the dream that hey you, you come here two months two months in then you'll come out with a 100k job which i mean that may have been true like five years ago when there was like an intense demand for developers but there's not enough supply but you know like economics always levels out so now there's more supply than there is demand then you're not going to just come in here getting like six figures Yes, and Kevin, are you seeing this? And tell me if, if I'm wrong, but it's not like a lot of developers, especially junior developers, have this attitude like, you know, a company needs to give a chance to me, right? A company mm -hmm. needs to pay me six figures and then they'll train me how to do this job in three months, right? And I think that's wrong because most companies, like, they're not going to pay you six figures to learn the job, or are they like, you first yeah. got to know how to do something right away, right? Yeah, six figures, you, you better be ready to go. Like, you, you better bring value immediately. They're not going to hold your hand. Uh, even like when you're making like 60 K that that's more than most people are making, you know, uh, like the, the reason they, they had, they trained you before was because there, there wasn't enough supply. So they could say to get somebody capable of doing a job. Yeah. We'll, we'll spend some time like holding your hand, but, uh, Hey, so this is kind of the subject, but you like, you, you know, you like, you missed the money, amount of money made. And so I was watching this TV show. Right. And it was like, and so the, they're talking to these females. And they're like, hey, uh, like, what, how tell you want a man to be? And they're like, everyone's like 6'2", right? 6'2". Okay, well, only like 3% of the world is like over 6'2", right? Okay, so that's, that's a lot of people out. And they said, well, what do you think a single per, a single guy in America make? What average money do you think they make, right? Oh, he has to make at least six figures, 200000 95000 right? Yeah. And they said the average single man in America makes 37000 right? And so they tell these females, you 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 try to look at someone who makes over six figures and six foot two, that's less than one percent of the population, right? And back to developers, right? You know, they're getting paid sixty thousand, hundred thousand dollars. They're getting way more than the average salary of most of you, the average American, right? And so companies gonna affect you, like you like you said, give some value, like and, and make it it's a contribution, I think. Yeah, I, I think like people think it's like a magical industry, it's not like law or you know medicine where they kind of realize like uh you have to be really good if you because if you want to get in because it's so saturated they kind of have that fantasy like yeah hey, i could just show up do a little bit of work and you know company's gonna you know fill my bank account with a lot of money but it's it's not like that anymore yeah. this this industry's matured like all the other ones yeah or i'll, I'll just go on five or upwork and make websites for people and make money that way well if they don't know you on those platforms either you're gonna struggle too i think yeah i think like a lot of people who really blow up who make a lot of money they got in early like with podcasting if you really want to blow up you had to get in early when there wasn't as much competition uh same, same with all these other industries like if you get in early you have a huge advantage but like uh if you get in later you, your skills have to be exceptional or you just have to have something that really makes you stand out and that's how like the software industry is now yeah and also with a junior developer a, a develops in, in, in general, like I think a lot of developers they're like in a bubble, like they like you know the developers of their own language, the way that like, they talk to, you know, everything has to be like in detail. I mean, and of course somebody's on the startup founder or the company owner that like, communicate what they want, but like if if you're working with someone, they say uh, build build this for me, I think you should ask them detailed question, right? Like you say build this door for you, example. Like, where do you want the handle at? Where do you want the thickness at, right? Because most people mm -hmm. like, I know me, I'm, I'm guilty of this. When I want someone to build something, I'll say like, build this, look like this. A lot of non-tech founders lack the skill to communicate properly to developers, right? And I, I think developers have a part in fixing that also, like non-tech founders have a way to fix that too, I think. Yeah, I think uh, the communication is important. And be like, if, if you're an employee, 
like being proactive that's really how you get promotions like you're, you're not waiting for your boss or manager to say hey do this do this do this you're asking like hey is this good is this what you wanted okay what what should i do next like like a, a lot a lot of people are kind of passive in the in the workplace they're just always waiting 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 for somebody to give them work waiting for somebody to tell them what to do but to, to be in a leadership position that's where you have to be like more proactive and it's not difficult to make yourself stand out right because I'm, I'm making this number up and, and, and i think this is now like for all time in the past and that that's not for developing like you know hr people markets anyone in general right it's like 80 percent of people like do i back like like 20 percent of people have that too like close out for you kevin and you're you paying back hundred thousand a year like that kevin's paying a hundred thousand dollars a year man i gotta do this i need to do that I need, I need to prove more than that amount of money. I need to give him $20,000 for the value. If he asks me to do something, maybe it's not my job, but I need to figure the shit out, you know? And then I think the other 80%, they're like, oh, Kevin's only paying me 100%. It's not my job, I'm not doing it, you know? Um, you know, this is too hard. I don't know what to do it, right? All that kind of stuff, right? And then people's the 80 ask why the people in the 20% always get promoted, always get raised, right? Because mm-hmm. they're making they're making them stuff stand out. Now, don't be wrong. You know, maybe your life is like you, you know you don't want to get promoted or get a raise and you're discontent. I mean, this this you know this place those people too, right? But like, don't complain if you don't get promoted, raise. You have this attitude. Oh, I'm only doing this. I'm only doing that, right? Yeah, I think like at the end of the day, uh, we have to realize the cold hard realities of what a business is. It's like something yeah. that you're there to make money for somebody, and they're going to look at you. Are you bringing value? What kind of impact are you making? You make a lot yeah. of impact, you get promoted. You don't make any impact, they fire you. Yeah. So, because, like, you know, most businesses are not nonprofits, and even nonprofits have to break even. Exactly. So, I thought, you know, I think, like, even junior developers need to start thinking, like, why would a company want to hire me? What kind of impact would I bring to the, com- the company? And, a lot of companies don't hire a junior developer because one, you have to train them. Two, it might be months before you know they get up to speed, and three, by the time they're up to speed and they start making contributions, they're already like looking for another job. So it's like I'm not gonna the companies are thinking I'm not gonna train the next company's mid-level developer. I know that's a big risk. You know, companies have to take. You know, and they don't want to take that big risk. Exactly. So, so so now like as a junior you almost have to come in as a, a mid-level somebody who's just ready to go here's a question for you, kevin let's suppose you're hiring a junior developer and you ask them hey let me see your, your portfolio and they said oh, i don't have one what would your mm-hmm. reaction be yeah i probably, probably have to uh if, if i didn't cut them short i would have to really like grill them on the you know technical stuff like do you really know these frameworks like uh you know if 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 they can really talk their way through a a technology then maybe i can like you know ask them like further questions and see like why don't you have a portfolio yeah or maybe i'm working on like a project that um you know i can't really reveal what it is but um if they don't if you know if they don't have that portfolio they're gonna have to do something else that really makes them stand out yeah. like they can't just uh come and give me the impression that they, they're not doing any work okay yeah it surprised me how many developers the designers don't have portfolios so so you've come across a lot of uh of, of juniors that yeah yeah like like what what is that pitch to you like how, how are they saying like uh, a lot of it's like you know like trust me i know what i'm doing you know or I can't show my portfolio because it's private or just I've heard all the kind of things, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if it, the the more risk somebody has to take on you to hire you, the the less compensation you're gonna you're gonna offer them. Like, you know, like your 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 risk. Like, I can't just pay you all this money and I don't know what I'm getting. I know. But yeah, man. Uh, I know I know it's coming to the top of the hour, man. I'd love to have you back. I know I have to get out of here and do some things, man. Are you open to coming back and we can continue oh, yeah. this conversation? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have a lot more to talk about, no doubt. Yeah, man. I I, I appreciate you for coming through. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll catch y'all next time. Peace.